camera kill him for the spaniel and tomahawk we have two time national champion hrch <laughs> let me tell you congratulations son i'm very proud of you i remember when you came off the line i was the first one to meet you there i didn't even say anything you remember what you told me what'd you say i said we just won the open Cameron Kennel, Boyga Spaniel. We got three time Boyga Spaniel National Champion, Mr. Jonathan Holland, and two time Boyga Spaniel National Champion, Chief. Chief is also a 100 Trooper Champion, Master Hunter. He is the novice 2018 Boyga Spaniel National winner. Most important, he's the big dog on the block, ladies and gentlemen, number one in the world. 2022 Boyga Spaniel Open Champion. My honor and privilege today doing an interview here with Mr. Jonathan Holland. Jonathan, you know, you're like a son to me. I know you don't wear much jewelry, okay? And I understand you spent a lot of time with Mr. Jonathan Underwood at Cap Rock Waterfowl hunting the big birds, okay? John, it was very impressive because John's was hunting these sandhill cranes and had to wear goggles. So, Bacon the Boykin, hashtag Hunt Retriever Champion, Bacon the Boykin, who Mr. Jonathan Holland put a Hunt Retriever Championship on Mr. Bacon. Jonathan and I are going to be spending time with Mr. Underwood out in West Texas. So, Jonathan, when I think of Texas, I think about a rodeo, okay? I think about national champion and the long, hard ride that you yourself have put in to Mr. Chief here. So, I want to honor you, Cavern Kindle Boy the Spaniel. Got you a belt buckle for you to wear with pride. I want you to notice the blue in here representing the blue ribbons with Mr. Chief. Uh, also the two diamonds, because Chief is a two-time Boykin Spaniel National Champion. And it says 2022 Boykin Spaniel Society Open National Champion. It says hunting retriever champion Chief Holland. He is also a master hunter, national champion 2018. Open champion 2022 and two time Boykin Spaniel National Champion. So, Jonathan, I want to give this to you to wear with pride. And one thing I'd like for you to talk about, if you don't mind, is the logo that Chiefs had and the tomahawk. So let me tell you, congratulations, son. I'm very proud of you. Thank you, Warren. <clears throat> this means a lot to me. Um, we drew that logo off of Chiefs' head. Um, we took a picture uh, when he was about a year old or so from his first hunting season. And uh, if you'll notice on his face, he don't really have them right now, but in the summertime when it gets toward hunting season, he'll have longer hairs and they usually turn blonde because we're outside a lot on the river and canoes, training, different things. And so he had the, the stripes on his nose. A lot of people think I named him Chief from being in the fire service and being a firefighter for all those years but what a lot of people don't know and I get asked about uh, how do we come up with the name Tomahawk and uh, on my birth certificate my heritage is Cheyenne River Sioux tribe uh, by by blood I'm a Native American and I've always kind of liked that and it's part of my heritage so I thought I would incorporate that into uh, into chief originally uh, this whole deal wasn't about me being a pro trainer or hunt test or any of that stuff. I just wanted a, a good hunting dog. And uh, and I, I just named him Chief out of my heritage. But when the rest of this stuff came about, um, I wanted to, to keep including that. So that's where the name Tomahawk came from and, uh, and Chief. And then we've got some other ideas down the road uh, that we're gonna incorporate the Native American, the Indian theme through. Uh, but that's kind of where the logo came from. It's, uh, it's an actual picture of Chief silhouette profile from the side uh, from his first hunting season. Oh. Uh, Jonathan, I've seen a picture of you, I think it was taken on the side of a road on your way home with Chief, and you looked very intense and had like a deep thought. Would you mind sharing what you were thinking at that time? Yeah, um, I know which picture you're talking about. We had stopped on their way home and uh, to let him air out, to let him you know, move around a little bit. It was about an eight hour drive home. And uh, I remember 
we were at a we pulled over to a cracker barrel and they had a grassy area over to the side and he was out running around and I've always talked to him since the day I picked him up and uh, I, I don't remember everything from that picture but I right before I'd gotten him uh, was the Bassmaster Classic over on Lake Gunnersville and uh, Randy Howell won it and I remember listening to him his interview after he won and he was trying to make his mind up on uh, that final day. He had stayed in one spot in a, in a creek for three days, or for two days straight, the Bassmaster Classics three days. That third day he was trying to decide if he was gonna go back to that spot or if this, he had a gut feeling telling him to go to this other bridge. And he finally asked himself, he said, you know, are you gonna be good or are you gonna be great? Hmm. And, uh, and I'm a quotes guy and that, that quote always stuck with me. And I remember kneeling down talking to Chief and at the time I didn't really know what that meant because I just wanted a good hunting dog. But I remember asking him in that picture, you know, little buddy, are you gonna be a good dog or are you gonna be a great dog? And uh, that picture is pretty special to me, Warren. <laughs> and needless to say, he did turn out to be a great dog. You know, there's a big thing within the human nature side, or, or is greatness born or is greatness made? Are leaders born or are le uh, leaders made? Because uh, you, you're the only person that's ever trained, Chief. Let's talk a little bit about his training. I mean, you're a professional trainer now. Uh, I've toured your kennels. It is a world-class kennel. The, be the best kennel I've ever seen at the training ground is phenomenal. Uh, but why, well, what got you interested in, okay, now I have a boy again, I have Chief, I'm going to start training him. Did you ever think about getting titles? Did you ever think that he would be a two-time Boykin Spaniel National Champion? I didn't. Um, <clears throat> when I bought him, I was spending a lot of time in Arkansas, <clears throat> and the year, the season before I bought him, I was out there by myself a lot. And I was hunting, I was killing birds. And, uh, but I didn't really have anybody out there with me. Uh, it was about a week stretch where I was out there by myself, limited every day, picked my shots, picked which birds I wanted to shoot. Um, but I had to go out there and pick them up myself. But that really wasn't the, the driving factor. I, I just wanted to, when I was little, I always wanted to have my own dog, my own retriever. And I always wanted a Boykin Spaniel. Uh, from a young age, the very first time I saw one, I, I wanted one. And uh, <clears throat> growing up, we didn't have the means to, you know, for anything like that. Um, and and back then, I mean, there wasn't a lot of information about training, you know, unless you just got in with the some of the old guards and the old school guys, and they taught you. You know, there wasn't social media and and those you know avenues back then. Really, it's just now getting to where there's more information out there, you know, that you can use. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so I got them and when I bought them and got them home I bought every bit of information I could possibly buy um, books uh, video series everything I can buy I had some friends um, that had had dogs in the past and uh, and they gave me some of their advice on what they do uh, how they train their dogs but they just had hunting dogs uh, but one of my best friends from high school he has a, uh, a dog kennel he trains labs and uh, so he started inviting me to come over and I would throw birds for him and help him out and he would help me with you know teaching me how to do obedience teaching me about you know keeping a tight standard on obedience and getting a dog retrieving and all that kind of stuff and that's really where I learned about the hunt test game was through him because he would take his dogs and he was very successful at the hunt test and his personal dog was a really good dog and uh, and so as we trained, uh, you know, throughout that first year, um, I decided I'd run him and started. Uh, I think he was seven months old when I ran him and started. It was right before hunting season. And um, so we went to, uh, to Mid-South over the other side of Huntsville. And uh, I ran him in his first two started tests. And, you know, he did a great job, no issues whatsoever. And uh, <clears throat> kind of got a little bit of my blood flowing there. But that, that really didn't do it for me. Uh, we went into his first hunting season. I think he, he picked up a little over 400 birds. 
uh, starting off at eight months old. His first retrieve was a speckle belly goose. Um, that's been kind of a popular thing for us. We, uh, you know, west of the Mississippi, they know me as Johnny Cash. That came from an old duck club. And uh, everybody knows Johnny Cash kills specks. And that was kind of special for me for that being one of, you know, his first retrieves was a speck. And being a little dog, you know, not knowing if they'd be able to do it, but made it through the first hunting season got into the first his first nationals in 2018. Uh, now how old was he then? He was right at a year old. Uh, 13 months I think something mm -hmm. like that. I, I can't remember exactly. His birthday is February 27th so he was probably about 13 14 months somewhere in there. Um, <clears throat> went to nationals no real expectations. The only way I really knew about nationals uh, I thought it was probably a pretty fun time a good group of people over there I'd seen it in the magazine mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, seen the oyster row seen what looked like a lot of fun and uh, wanted to go experience that with my dog but also wanted to see you know how good of a job we would do so went to nationals um, started off we went to the oyster rows next morning started off the meeting went and did the first series did a pretty good job I thought um, Pretty much all of his runs are on our YouTube channel. Okay. So if anybody wants, and, and we did that for a uh, educational purpose because there's not a lot of information out there on Boykins Bank. Now how would they get to that? Uh, what is your YouTube It's uh, Tomahawk Boykins. Just if you go to search Tomahawk Boykins on YouTube, you'll find it, or any of my social media it's linked to, to the YouTube. Okay. Um, but it's on there. Uh, the first series was a, first mark was a, a landmark. Second mark was a pretty good swim across the pond. Uh, <clears throat> got through the first series good. Went to the second series. It was two landmarks and kind of a sage field. No issues there. Went to the third series. First mark was a landmark, but there was a log in the way. And uh, I think we were down to about 20 dogs now. They had done cut the field. I can't remember for sure how many dogs. I want to say there was maybe 80 or 90 dogs in the, in the novice that year. Um, but they had a mark in line with a log and he was one of the one of the only dogs that went out there and actually took the log on I don't know that he squared it perfectly but he he did a, he did approach it you know and, and didn't just dodge it come back there was an angle entry watermark and I think one of the main things that decided the winner was that that mark in the third uh, I think him and one other dog was the only two that actually took the angle entry all the way to the bird and then took the angle entry exit uh, back out. <clears throat> and I remember in the third also the judges commenting on his line manners after he picked that watermark up. Mm. And so his obedience and line manners along with his marking um, was really starting to shine in the third. They had narrowed the dogs down, now they were picking the winners. So we get into the fourth <clears throat> and it was three single marks. And the first mark there was kind of a peninsula running out into the water and then a then a swim and then the bird was landing on the the dam side of this pond and on the dam there was uh there was some pretty heavy sage type cover <clears throat> most of the birds were landing in the sage and i remember when we shot chief's mark off his landed on the bank and i thought we got a good bird here you know in a, in a field trial and i didn't know all this then but in field trials and hunt tests you know you don't necessarily need good luck <clears throat> you just don't need any bad luck mm. but if you get some good luck you want to take it you know yeah. you want to take every opportunity and i knew we had a good bird that it gave him that it gave a lot of the other dogs trouble straight line there straight line back good line manners <clears throat> second bird there was a little ditch of water opened back up into the pond it was a big laid down tree cluster of trees right there the bird was going left to right behind the trees dog had to take the channel get back in the water push through the tree get in there and fight the tree dig that bird out come back mm -hmm. he did it almost perfectly got in there hooked it just a little bit got in there got the bird come back didn't cheat did a great job as he was picking that bird up it started raining rain on the water to a young dog and really any dog can be problems because it, it breaks up the water surface okay it just causes some issues so it starts raining, bird comes out left to right, there's another little ditch to cross back into the water and there was a stump out there. Mm. <clears throat> that stump 
is the reason why I have a stick pond on my property today. Stumps and young dogs don't go well together. <laughs> he hooked to the stump, quickly seen it wasn't a bird. Did a pretty, pretty short figure eight, comes up with a bird, comes back. Walked off the line, <clears throat> knew we had done a good job. Didn't know, you didn't think you won? At this point, this is my first field trial. We, we had, me and Beck had watched all the dogs. In our mind, there was a dog named Tonic, uh, Chris Mars dog. Big dog, older dog, hard charging. We were both pretty sure he had won. Um, <clears throat> there were some other nice dogs in the in the flight. I think the final, they had cut it down to maybe eight or 10 dogs for that final series. So driving back, you know, we had, we had a notebook out and we were writing down. We thought we probably jammed. We thought we probably got a ribbon. We've done pretty good, but I don't think either one of us thought ever, it never crossed our mind we had won. Ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna take a momentary break and whenever we come back, I call Mr. Jonathan Holland the Boykin Dancer. We're going to see how Jonathan dances with a Boykin. And our first place dog is number 61, Holly Creek's Chief Holland. Kennel boy, the spaniel, and tomahawk. He's talking about hunter super champion, master hunter, two time boy, spaniel national champion. Two. All right, Jonathan, uh, you and I have known each other a few years, and it just happened to be uh, by fate, I would say, that you and I teamed up together last year. Uh, one thing I've noticed about you is that the test is or the competition is won or lost on the line and when i watch you handle boykin it's like an orchestrator in an orchestra i mean it's it's very impressive it, it's it's i call it the boykin dance i call it you know you dance with the boykins i call you the boykin whisperer how is it that you get the dog to do what you need to do when you're at the line and make it look, it, it's an art, it's a talent, it's a skill uh, that is very successful for you. Uh, Three-time Boykin Spaniel National Champion in five years. So what do you do with the dogs to get them to dance with you and be your partner? So talk about getting into the mind of a Boykin training and boykins are like people not all people are the same and not all boykins are the same so could you talk about that <clears throat> so you are right it's won or lost at the line uh, some of the greatest retrievers out there of any breed uh, can't play the game because they can't sit still on the line uh, my my mentor and best friend chris scott it, his dog tig you know, he's, he started him too early. He pushed him real fast, real hard, real early. And, and he'll tell you to this day, he calls those, those line manners. Tig is a, he is a phenomenal specimen of a dog. He looks like a bodybuilder of a retriever. He's a big yellow lab and he's, he's just awesome. He can mark, I mean, he can do it all, but it's, he can't do it all in the game because he can't sit still on the line. <clears throat> all that starts as a puppy. First thing you do is you start enhancing the natural prey drive in that dog. All the natural abilities, you've got a golden window of eight weeks to six months. From eight weeks to six months, you can impact that little dog's brain. Everything about that dog, you can get, you can start enhancing his natural ability. You can start teaching him to retrieve. That's the first thing I do when I get him home. I start teaching him to retrieve. I sit down on the floor with him. I get in the hallway. <clears throat> I've got little different little toys I use. I start getting retrieves out of them. I also start taking treats. I use hot dogs. Any particular brand of hot dog? You know, Warren, <clears throat> I'm kind of tight. Yeah. I'm a dollar store man. 
88 cents a pack. No, it don't have to be Nathan. They don't have to be Nathan. I've yeah. yet to find a Boykin Spaniel that says, nope, I ain't eating that hot dog. It ain't Oscar Mayer Wiener. <laughs> you go get me an Oscar Mayer Wiener or I ain't sitting for you. <laughs> they all like hot dogs. So I'll, I'll take a hot dog. I'll usually break it in half or break me a chunk off of it and hold it in my hand. I'll start teaching a dog to sit. I'll start teaching them to hear and heal. I'll teach them everything I need to know with that hot dog. When Chief was 11 or 12 weeks old, I had taught him all his basic commands. I had taught him to run. We had a little rug runner. I had at the, from one end to the other, it was probably 15 feet. I had a little file box set up. All the, I got all this on video. <clears throat> I taught him to place, and I had him casting left and right off of place to another file box at like 11 or 12 weeks old. Wow. All by using hot dogs and just spending time with him. I was teaching his brain how to learn. I was setting him up how to learn. With doing all that, I was still getting my retrieves in. We were getting retrieves in all day long, every day. He was so socialized. I worked at the fire station back then. I just retired about a week ago. But <clears throat> by the time I bought him, until about a week a week ago, he never missed a shift at the fire station. Mm. He went with me every shift to the fire station. He used to ride around in the truck with me going to job sites. Mascot. Every, he was the fire station mascot, so he was socialized. He's been to Lowe's, he's been to Home Depot. He, everywhere I went, he went. So he got to experience all those things. In Chief's training, looking back, I mean, now you're a three-time Boyk and Spaniel national champion professional trainer. So, uh, back whenever you started off with Chief, uh, any mistakes you made that you're like, wow, I would not do that myself, nor advise my clients to do that either. Most of the things that I've done with Chief that I would go back and fix, or I would go back and, and not do and redo, is it, it evolves around water. Um, one of the first, the, the, one of the most ignorant, egotistical, um, dumbest things that I, that I done was his first hunting season. It was, uh, all my buddies was out there, we now were how videoing. Old was Chief at this point? We started the season at eight months. That was in November. So December, January, he was nine or ten months old. Okay. Eleven months old, somewhere in there. We get this big freeze. It starts thawing out. We're killing limits of birds every day. We got Chief just crushing through the ice. Now he's going out there and getting them. But you can tell it don't take long and he's war and, and he don't want to go no more. Now I'm having to make him go get them. And it's, and and I think that was one of the biggest things that have caused a lot of the water issues I've got now. Jonathan, I love the movie. The Legend of Bagger Vance. And one of the scenes in there is when Bagger told Juna he'd been hacking at the ball. I mean, it was it was terrible. Terrible. Bobby Jones was kicking his rear end, and he was frustrated. He was down and out. I mean, but it was a great turning point in the movie. Bagger Vance said, look at Bobby Jones. And he's like, what are you talking about? He sees the field. He's like, what are you talking about? Just watch him. He sees the field. So when you're up there on the line, I watched you this past national when Chief went. It was like you were standing there, had your tomahawk kennels hat on, had your sunglasses, your jacket, and you were just so intense. What goes through your mind before you run, before you get to the line, while you're in the holding blind, and then once you get to the line. Do you see the field? <clears throat> that's something that's taken me a long time to develop, and it's still a work in progress. Um, I think a lot of things go into that. I think maturity uh, with the dogs and in the game um, and in life goes into it. 
I think experience plays a big role. I think education, not only in training, but as a handler, um, understanding different concepts, understanding different setups, thinking about changes in terrain, thinking about the wind, thinking about the sun. There's so many things to look at. It takes a lot. It takes a lot of experience. It takes a lot of time to do that. But there's also some human aspects that go into it too. You've got to have a very clear mind. There's a lot of things that can happen at a field trial that people can put thoughts into your head. Social media can put thoughts into your head. Your ego. <laughs> if Chris Scott was sitting here right now, he'd start talking about my ego. That's his, that's his, he wears me out about it. But he's right. I mean, but I also think, you know, at some point you gotta be, you gotta feel confident. You know, maybe cocky is not the word. They say I'm cocky, and I say what it ain't bragging my radio. Get it. Back it up. They say I'm cocky, and I say what it ain't bragging radio. Get it. Back it up. But you've got to go into it, especially a trial where you feel confident, where you feel like you've got a good dog. You got the dog to win. Yeah. You can't go into it thinking we don't have a chance, or my dog's not good enough, or I'm not good enough. You've got to go into it with a little bit of confidence. You know, so uh, there, uh, Chris says all the time, there's a fine line between confidence and arrogance, mm -hmm. you know, and which side of that line are you walking on? Um, and, and he's right, but you still have to have it to play those games. That's, that's part of seeing the field. But to have a clear head and to walk up there and to really see it, it takes all the things I just talked about. It takes experience. It takes maturity. It takes education. It takes confidence. It takes a clear mind to walk up there. I remember hearing a lot of the people in the crowd talking about that first series at this 2022 Nationals that Chief won. And before a dog ran, they were talking about, well, this is just a, a simple setup. There's nothing to this setup. Well, there was a lot to that setup. It was a big rolling hill. It was mm -hmm. a bird throw right at the base of a small tree. It was another holding blind right behind it that they were using to plant the blind that was sitting on the edge of the hill. Then they threw a mom and pop out of a cluster of trees, angled back and angled in. So you send your dog out there you pick up that angled in bird. You turn back to the outside and you got to run right at that tree and kind of at the holding blind. Up, you know, kind of swap the side of the hill. You come back and you're looking back down that hill and you kick the dog off. And if they didn't see it good, they split the, the tree. Mm -hmm. A lot of the dogs that did see it stopped short where that angle in was because it wiped them out. Well, when they stopped short and the bird wasn't there, they drifted up the hill. So the concept was there. The vision was there. I remember the judge saying when Chief, Chief ran straight, really, really straight lines, he picked up that last bird. We, they told us to turn around so they could plant the blind. The blind wasn't hot. And uh, when I turned around, the lady judge, she said, you knew he was fixing to get that bird, didn't you? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, we saw his, his ears acknowledge you when you took your time. She said, you know, you really took your time and lined him up and let him see that picture. And he acknowledged you by rolling his ears back. And she said, I saw that. I said, yes, ma'am, I did too. And from there, from there on out, I knew we were in good shape. You know, when we went to the second series, they threw a little gap bird, they threw a bridge bird, then they threw one, just a little splash in the water. Well, it didn't look like much, you know, to the untrained eye. But if your dog's never picked up a bridge mark, you got problems. They had a white decoy sitting out there pulling you off that bridge mark. Then you had to split that gap. There's just so many concepts involved, but until you understand it, until you put the education and experience there, you don't see it. Mm -hmm. And I still got a long way to go, but I see it better now. I, I, I'm to the point where I do walk up and I see this, this could be a potential issue. I watch the other dogs to figure out, yep, that was an issue, or no, they're handling it pretty good. So that that's kind of where you're at with seeing the field. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, let me let's go back to the 2022 Boys and Spaniel National. Uh, 
I was there. Uh, I was watching you run, Chief, and watching you run bacon. And uh, I remember when you came off the line, I was the first one to meet you there. I didn't even say anything. You remember what you told me? What'd you say? Tear me up, Warren. I said, we just won the Open. Just won the 2022 Boykin Spaniel National Open with this little five-year-old pup here. You know what? Earlier we talked about when you got Chief pulled over to Cracker Barrel, you looked in his eyes and said, are you going to be good? Are you going to be great? I think Chief had an answer. I think Chief said, I'm going to be great, but I'm going to make you great. Here we are today. Good job, Chief. You made him great, buddy. You didn't know you did, but yeah, 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 I know I did. I had this whole plan the whole time. I did. <laughs> what does this dog mean to you, and how's this dog changed your life and the people that the Lord has brought into your life through this little brown dog? I wouldn't be sitting here right now. Um, complete change of pass and uh, um, I've been a I've been in the construction business since I graduated high school um, as low as you know I've, I've mixed mud and toted brick and block I've worked for about every trade in the construction industry I've, I've got a real estate license and started with that I got my contractor's license kind of moved my way up that way um, and then I, I got in with a fire bit, fire service, became a firefighter, did that for 10 years along with my uh, contract, my construction company. And you just retired from uh, being a firefighter, so thank you for your service in that. Thank you. And so with doing all that, this one dog created a whole different life for me. Um, Mo, the people that I talk to on a daily basis now, my best friends, you, Chris Scott, um, probably the last 10 people I talk to in my phone, it, it's all because of this one dog. Um, I have got to go pretty much coast to coast hunting at places, very nice high-end places uh, because of this one dog. Uh, you know, I guide waterfowl hunts out in West Texas with Cap Rock and, and, uh, and Underwood now because of this one dog. Um, you know, the, the lifestyle I live now, the places I've, I've been, uh, you know, we travel a lot for hunt test, competition. Um, I've got good clients. Uh, we, were, we were down in the Florida Keys for a few days earlier this spring. Uh, you know, with some of my good clients that invited me up that I met through this one dog that said, Hey, come down and go fishing with us, you know. Um, pretty, I've always been uh, an outdoors guy. Uh, from, you know, from a little little boy, all I wanted to do was go fishing. I wanted to go hunting. I wanted somebody to carry me. And uh, and for a long period of life, all I, all I was able to do was work, you know. I, I missed a lot of things. And, uh, and then this one dog is allow me to catch up on a lot of it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm thankful for Hunt Retriever Champion, Master Hunter, two-time Boykin Spaniel, National Champion, Chief! Because if it wasn't for Chief, Jonathan Holland and I would not be here right now. So we just wanted to take a little bit of time and honor Chief, and I want to honor his owner and trainer, Mr. Jonathan Holland, and it's been an honor and a privilege. Thank you, Warren. Cowboy.